At extreme temperatures, your body effectively stops fighting the cold and starts sacrificing parts of itself to ensure survival of the core. This isn't a malfunction. It's a desperate programmed survival protocol. The first line of defense is a system-wide clampdown called vasoconstriction. Your sympathetic nervous system floods your body with norepinephrine, forcing the smooth muscles in the walls of your blood vessels to contract, particularly in your extremities, your fingers, toes, nose, and ears. This dramatically narrows the arteries, reducing the volume of warm blood flowing to the surface and redirecting it inward to protect your vital organs. But this creates an immediate problem. The tissues in your extremities are now starved of heat and oxygen. To counteract this, your body initiates a paradoxical defense known as the hunting response. After several minutes of intense constriction, the vessels will suddenly dilate, allowing a warm pulse of blood to rush back into the freezing tissues. This cycle of constriction and dilation is the body's attempt to walk a tightrope, preserving core heat while keeping its outermost parts from freezing solid. In moderate cold, it works. But against the relentless pressure of extreme cold, this strategy is a losing battle. Each brief pulse of warmth radiates away into the environment, an unaffordable loss of energy that ultimately accelerates the cooling of the core. The body recognizes when this battle is lost. A tipping point is reached where the hypothalamus, your internal thermostat, makes a brutal life or death calculation. The survival of the core is now the only priority. The hunting response is abandoned. The command is issued to cease all attempts to save the extremities. The vasoconstriction becomes total and sustained. Specialized blood vessels, known as arteriovenous shunts, may open up deep within the limbs, creating a direct bypass for blood to return to the core without ever reaching the capillaries in the fingers and toes. It's a physiological triage of the highest order. The body has effectively severed these parts from its life support system, sacrificing them to prevent a fatal drop in core temperature. These tissues are now isolated, without circulation, without heat, and completely vulnerable to the physics of the cold. Their temperature begins to plummet, approaching the ambient air temperature, and the process of freezing begins at the cellular level. This is where the direct physical destruction starts. As the temperature in the abandoned tissue drops below zero degrees Celsius, the water in the extracellular space, the fluid surrounding your cells, begins to freeze. It doesn't form smooth, harmless ice. Instead, water molecules align into a rigid crystalline lattice. These ice crystals are microscopic, but they are also incredibly sharp and jagged. They grow like needles and shards of glass in the delicate spaces between your cells. As these crystals expand, their razor-sharp edges physically puncture and tear through the fragile cell membranes. This is not a subtle chemical process. It is a direct, mechanical shredding of the tissue's fundamental structure. Cell walls are breached, and organelles are damaged. This immediate physical trauma initiates a cascade of cell death, destroying the very architecture of the skin, muscles, and nerves. While the ice crystals inflict damage from the outside, an even more insidious process unfolds simultaneously. Osmotic shock. Ice is pure water. As water molecules are pulled from the extracellular fluid to form these growing crystals, the remaining unfrozen fluid becomes a highly concentrated slurry of salts, electrolytes, and other solutes. This creates a severe osmotic gradient across the cell membrane. Inside the cell, the solute concentration is now much lower than the brutally saline slush outside. Driven by the fundamental laws of osmosis, water is violently pulled out of the cells in a desperate attempt to equalize this concentration imbalance. The cells rapidly dehydrate, shriveling and collapsing in on themselves. As they shrink, the concentration of electrolytes and metabolic byproducts inside the cell skyrockets to toxic, life-ending levels. This combination of external mechanical shredding and internal dehydration and chemical poisoning creates a completely unsurvivable environment for the cell. While this immediate freezing damage is catastrophic at a cellular level, the most severe devastation often begins only after the rewarming process starts. As heat returns to the frozen tissue, a cascade of secondary injuries known generically as reperfusion injury begins to accelerate the damage. This process is a cruel paradox. The return of life-sustaining, oxygenated blood becomes the very agent of destruction. As circulation resumes in the oxygen-starved cells, it triggers the formation of highly unstable molecules known as oxygen-free radicals. These molecules are molecular wrecking balls, initiating a chain reaction called oxidative stress. They violently strip electrons from vital cellular components, 
catastrophically damaging proteins, shredding cell membranes, and corrupting the genetic code within DNA. Simultaneously, the damaged cells release a flood of inflammatory signals, summoning an immune response that, in this chaotic environment, contributes to the swelling and cellular death. This secondary assault is often more devastating and widespread than the initial physical damage caused by the ice crystals themselves, turning a survivable injury into a catastrophic one. This inflammatory cascade has a dire consequence for the circulatory system itself, vascular thrombosis. The delicate inner lining of the blood vessels, known as the endothelium, has already been mechanically shredded by the sharp edges of intracellular ice crystals. When blood flow returns, this raw, damaged surface acts as a powerful trigger for platelets, the body's emergency clotting agents. Instead of a controlled repair, a massive, unregulated aggregation occurs. Platelets swarm the damaged sites, forming large, dense clots or thrombi that completely block the small blood vessels. This is not a temporary blockage. It is a permanent seal. The tissue downstream of these clots is now completely cut off from its blood supply, leading to irreversible cell death a condition known as necrosis. As this dead tissue begins to decay while still attached to the body, it results in gangrene, a state of blackened, dying flesh that often necessitates amputation to prevent the spread of infection. The visible outcome of this underlying destruction is categorized into distinct clinical stages, defined by the depth of the injury. The mildest form is frost nip, a superficial freezing of the skin's outermost layers. It presents as white, numb patches of skin, but it is fully reversible with gentle rewarming and causes no permanent damage. The next level is superficial frostbite. Here, the damage reaches the dermis, the deeper layer of skin. Upon rewarming, the area becomes red and swollen, and within one to two days, large blisters filled with clear or milky fluid will form. While painful, recovery is possible, though permanent sensitivity to cold may remain. Finally, there is deep frostbite, the most severe stage. The freezing penetrates all layers of the skin and extends into the underlying tissues, including muscles, tendons, and even bone. The affected area remains numb, hard, and cold even after rewarming. The blisters that form are often smaller and filled with blood. Over weeks, the tissue dies completely, turning black and hard in a process called dry gangrene or mummification. Even if the tissue is saved, the long-term neurological impacts can be profound. Nerves are exquisitely sensitive to both freezing and the subsequent oxidative stress, often leading to permanent damage. This can manifest as chronic pain, extreme sensitivity, or a complete loss of sensation. Some individuals suffer from phantom pain, feeling excruciating sensations from a limb that has been amputated. The physics of treatment is therefore critical to minimizing this outcome. Rapid rewarming, typically in a warm water bath between 37 and 39 degrees Celsius, is physically superior to slow rewarming. The reason is that ice crystals do the most mechanical damage as they thaw and recrystallize. Slow rewarming prolongs the time spent in this damaging temperature zone, allowing the crystals to inflict maximum cellular injury. Rapid immersion, conversely, moves the tissue through this dangerous phase as quickly as possible, minimizing the duration of mechanical stress and subsequent reperfusion injury. Have you ever experienced the initial warning signs of frost nip, and how quickly were you able to reverse it? Share your experiences in the comments below and subscribe for more deep dives into human physiology.